really do realize that some of us are wondering why we're going to talk about grief. I mean, no one has died. I haven't died. You haven't died. So that's not the issue. But there's also grief that comes with change and loss. And we know that. And we don't talk about it much, but we know that in the depths of our being. Real grief, they say, if you're grieving over the loss of someone, whether it's due to death or moving or being away, loss of a relationship, it can take uh, one to two years for that to heal. If it's somebody particularly close to you, it can take five years. And we know of cases where you truly never get over the grief you feel about the loss of somebody you care about. It's part of the human condition. Not always a part we enjoy, but it's a part of our humanity. We know one thing for certain, grief hurts. Katie had sent me a text and wanted to know if it was appropriate to use Charlie Brown on the screen for the sermon, and I thought, how perfect could it be? Because no one knows grief like Charlie Brown knew. You know, and Charlie often said, good grief. But you know, there is such a thing as good grief, and that's what we're going to talk about today. What is grief exactly? It's, it's a deep feeling, a deep anguish, a deep sadness, a heartache. When, when I looked up the definition, there's an old word in there, but it's a great old word. It's the word woe, because sometimes that's, the, that's a great description of how we feel when we're in the midst of grief or the loss of something or someone we care about. I read an article as I was preparing the message for this week from Psychology Today, and the man that wrote the article said that in our brain, in our limbic system of our brain, that human attachment, me to you, you to each other, you to your children, to the people you love in your life, is mapped very deeply in the limbic system of our brain. It's a story of relationships in the depths of our being. I say it so often to people, the relationships are vital, they're critical. We talked about it last week in the message, friendships. But relationships are vital. Our relationships with each other, our relationship with our family, our relationship with God. And so what happens when there's a change in relationship? There's a change deep with not only in our hearts, but our brains. And we begin to mourn because of that change and because of that loss. So the story has to do with loss. Don't uh, miss this. Mourning may be an emotional and a psychological process, but it's also a biological one. It, it wrecks our bodies sometimes as we mourn for people. I, I thought about it a lot, and it's, it's kind of funny, but you know, when we grieve, when we mourn, when we cry over loss, it can be difficult for some people to understand. <laughs> when my father passed away, I can remember my mother used to go to the cemetery every week, and my sisters, of course, doing the good sisterly thing, called me and said, do something about this. And I said, well, what do you want me to do? She's grieving. Everyone grieves differently. She knew my father wasn't there. She's a person of faith. But that's what she needed to do in her grief process. My daughter, though it's been almost two years since she lost her son, will, will call me and say, I'm really feeling terrible today. Is there something wrong with me? And I say, no, you're normal. You're grieving, you're hurting, you're in mourning, and it may take a long time. No one can tell you how to grieve. No one can tell you what to do with your grief. And so it's important that we recognize that, and I know as a, as a man, you know, sometimes I'm not supposed to grieve because it's not manly. It's not manly to cry. And, and yet, folks, let me tell you, sometimes God gives us the gift of tears because they can cleanse us and bring us relief that nothing else can bring us. And so sometimes that happens. I've had a lot of tears. I had tears yesterday. I was able to hold them in for a while, but yesterday I had three lovely girls come to my office and they were having to leave. They didn't know they were gonna have to leave and they're not gonna be here for the next two weeks. And they all wanted to say goodbye because they won't see me again in the near future. And each one of them hugged me, and I did really well until the one broke into tears. And I held it together until they left, because, you know, I'm a man. I'm not supposed to cry in front of others. But the tears release. The tears of grief at parting. Because, indeed, parting is such sweet sorrow. There is no doubt about it. 
And sometimes we think it's wrong. I mean, I know men that look at their, their wives who have grieved for something and it's like, oh, you know, put on a happy face. Quit doing that. That usually works well. Husbands, doesn't it? Telling your wife how to feel? You know, that's usually a successful thing. But we have to let people grieve. We have to let them be who they are. Grief hurts. It's sadness. It's anguish. It's woe. But grief can be a gift. I know you don't think of that in this moment. It's been hard for me this week as I prepared to think of that. And I know it's true. But I, it still gets it. Oh, how can it be? And I've thought of a lot of scenes this week. And one that popped into my mind from recent times was the man who's whose son shot those students on a campus in California. And the picture of him at the podium, and he would not be comforted. His grief was overwhelming, not only for his own son, but for those who his son had killed and hurt. And he would not be comforted. We see that often in scenes of war. Those that, that stand in the midst of destruction and devastation and will not be comforted because of the grief that is is in them and around them. And they cry out and they show the pain and the misery in each of us. Whether you're having any grief over my moving or not, every one of us faces grief. Every one of us faces dark moments in our lives when difficult things happen. And there are so many scriptures that speak to grief. We just used a couple of them at the beginning of the message today so you could get an idea of some of those. But I was thinking one in a place that we don't often think about. In that beginning of Matthew, remember Matthew is the gospel that walks through the story of who Jesus is. Starting with, remember, his genealogy. I mean, Matthew really starts at the beginning. He chases the, tra tra traces the genealogy of Jesus all the way back. And then he tells the story of the pre-birth narrative and the birth narrative. And then he tells this very unique story. In fact, in some circles, we call it the slaughter of the innocents. It's the time when King Herod becomes frightened about this new king and orders all of these children to be killed, all the males under two years old to be killed, and Jesus flees to Egypt with his family to miss the slaughter, but all of these children are slaughtered. And Matthew said, there is, a, there is crying, there is wailing that can be heard in Israel. Rachel is weeping for her children because they are no more. That's an amazing, powerful passage in the beginning. When we should be talking about Christmas presents, still in the Magi. But Matthew reminds us of suffering and struggle, even in the midst of our joy. And Rachel, sometimes considered the mother of the children of Israel, is crying, and her crying will not be silent. She will not be consoled in that moment because she needs to grieve. She needs to share her grief. You know, at the beginning, Matthew shows us this, and he walks us through this, and he does something by doing this for us. He deals with grief. So many of us cover up grief. I did it for years. I mean, I didn't want to let anybody know that I was grieving or sad. Didn't want anybody to know that I had hurt or had tears. And now I can go to a movie and cry at the stupidest movies you've ever seen. Because that's the way God is healing me. And I express grief in movies that maybe I can't express when they happen. You know, as a pastor, I have done hundreds, literally hundreds of funerals and memorial services. And most of those, I, I'm very professional and don't cry. But then I can go see a movie and cry and release that grief that needs to be released. And we all have grief that needs to be released. Don't cover it up. It can be a gift to you to heal. Because if you don't move on with your grief, that's when you get stuck. That's when it won't leave you alone. That's when it eats you from the inside out. How much better it is for us to face it, to confront it, to deal with it, and be able to move on. You see, it's not easy because with some things, there's no easy answer. We, as people of faith, understand that deeply. But comfort begins with grief. That's why grief is a gift. That's where the comfort begins, when we start to deal with that. God breaks us down. God wears us out. And as we 
open to the grief that exposes in us tender places, raw places that are hurting. But if we can only wrestle with the grief, whether it's over the loss of a loved one, whether it's over a departure, whether it's over my move, but then believe me, folks, this has been a, such a difficult move for me. Whatever it is, if I can wrestle with it, then the light of God that God provides for us can start breaking in and healing. You see, the story of Jesus doesn't end with Rachel's weeping. Weeping is never the end. It's so important to recognize that. My daughter was here and helped me pack my home and my office, and we would sit down, and there would be times, and she knew it as I just had to sit down on the couch as I was overwhelmed with grief. I've tried to explain it. I think I tried to last week why this move is so difficult for me. Because you have been with me at some critical times in my life. And you have been some of the best friendships that I've ever been able to make. And Donna Young, yeah, you broke my heart last week. I don't know if I can keep from crying now. Donna said to me, she's never had a pastor that was her friend until now. You want to know why I'm grieving? You want to know why I have tears in my eyes right now? It's because that's the way I feel about you. And I need to grieve for my loss. And I hope you will feel okay to grieve. Okay to let it go. You see, Psalm 30 says, Weeping may endure for the night, but joy will come in the morning. Maybe not tomorrow morning yet but it will come for all of us. The great uh, nurse, educator, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote about grief. She was the first one to categorize grief and she talks about the stages of grief. And I'm just gonna mention those briefly. We're not gonna preach on them, but, but some of you may be in different places if you are grieving my leaving. Uh, I know I have went through these. I'm still not sure I'm at the last stage yet. I, I made this move as a choice, but that doesn't mean it was an easy choice. And those stages of grief are number one, denial. And sometimes when we deny something that's happened, whether it's death or loss of any other kind, we just develop a false reality and we act like it's not going to happen. And so that's the first stage. The second stage is anger. We look who to blame. Who can we blame for this thing? Is it God's fault? I can remember when I left the church after many years before in the Midwest and, and the chair of the staff parish committee was really angry with the district superintendent. And the district superintendent said, well, don't blame me. And he looked at him and he said, well, I gotta blame somebody and you're here. <laughs> so, so sometimes we have to do that, but we search through that and then we can move through that. And then we begin bargaining. And we bargain to, to avoid grief sometimes. And, and we say, oh, if, if, if I'm really good, God, will you allow this to happen? There's a great scene at the, at the end of a movie called The End, starring Burt Reynolds. Didn't say a great movie, I said a great scene. <laughs> and he's been trying to kill himself. He didn't want to live, and he decides he wants to live, but he has swam out into the ocean as far as he could go because he thought if he wore out, he would just drown. And then he decides he wants to live, and so he starts swimming back, and he starts bargaining with God, and it's, you know, God, if you... Help me make it to the shore. I'll give all my money to the poor, and I'll go to church every week, and I'll pray, and I'll do all these things. And, and, it was, and then the closer he gets to the shore, the bargaining lessens. <laughs> you know, and he wants to give less and less to God as he moves towards the shore. But that's bargaining. For some, then, and for all of us, the next stage is depression. And that's when things lose meaning for us. Why bother? Thank you, Linda Phillips, for saying, you're no longer going to go to church when I took on. She doesn't mean that. <laughs> but that sometimes hits, all, it hits me as, as I'm going through the motions in these last weeks, and sometimes it feels like I'm going through the motions. And so that's depression that hits us. And finally, the last stage is acceptance, when we realize it is going to be okay. And I probably won't realize that until I'm at my next church and my children and grandchildren are surrounding me and I remember why I made this choice. For some of you, I think it will happen quickly. And some of you will happen when a new pastor steps into the pulpit and preaches and you say, oh, he can preach. 
oh, he's okay. And for others, it may take longer, but it's something we all go through. But here's what's important to remember. God is with us. God expects us to mourn. God expects us to feel grief and pain. But then we know this as Christians from 1 Thessalonians. God, grief will come into our lives. No one is immune. But for the child of God, we are not without hope. Do not grieve as those who have no hope grieve. Separation hurts. Sadness and sorrow will come, but Jesus will not abandon us in our time of need. It's so important to recognize this. Our mourning will be turned into joy. You know, I, you know how much I love movies. You know how much I love music from six years together. And I, and I chose a song for each week in this series because I think it's important. It helps me and my moving on. And last week, we, we talked about the song that the Rittenhouse is saying for us today in the message. This week, I'm going to talk about a song that touches my heart at a depth that's amazing. And it's not a Christian song. It's a song by one of my favorite uh, song writers, Warren Zavon. A lot of you have probably never heard of Warren Zavon. He was praised and honored by all of his contemporaries from Bruce Springsteen to Bob Dylan and on up. I even read an article reading this week, country music people just honored him for his writing belly. Dwight Yoakam was one of his good friends. So wherever you fit on that scale, you may not know Warren Zavon, but that's who he was. Unfortunately, Warren had a uh, lifelong fear of doctors. And so in 2002, he had been having problems and he went to the doctor. Not that it would have mattered a lot because he had, what is it, mesothelioma, the cancer caused by asbestos exposure. And he was, knew he wasn't going to live long. And so he put together a last album he made. And in that last album, he, he wrote a song. It was the last song he wrote. It was the last song he recorded. And the album was released on August 26, 2003. Being a big fan of his, I was honored with that, because that's my birthday. And I was honored with that. On September 7th, 2003, 12 days later, Warren Zavon died. The album went on to win three Grammy Awards, including Best Song of the Year for this song, Keep Me in Your Heart for a While. It was Warren's farewell to his friends, and to his family. And, and I want to use some of the words of that song today because it's the way I feel about you. I will keep you in my heart for quite a while. And I hope you will with me. Uh, apologies to Warren as I changed a few words to make them fit my life and not his. But here are some of the words from the song. Shadows are fallen and I'm running out of breath. Keep me in your heart for a while. If I leave, it doesn't mean I love you any less. Keep me in your heart for a while. When you get up in the morning and see that crazy sun, keep me in your heart for a while. There's a train leaving nightly called When All's Been Said and Done. Keep me in your heart for a while. Sometimes when you're doing simple things around the church, maybe you'll think of me and smile. Keep me in your heart for a while. Hold me in your thoughts. Take me to your dreams. Touch me as I fall into view, and I will be right next to you. Keep me in your heart for a while. It will be that way for me. And may it be that way for you. Thanks be to God. Amen.